Let's wait another two minutes and then we'll get started. Give people time to show up. Is everybody here uh, in Astoria, based in Astoria? I believe so. Hi. Kyle, are you? Well, I was in Astoria for eight years and then I got a COVID deal and moved to the Upper East Side uh -huh. and I just got my lease renewal and my rent has gone up almost $700. So I yeah. might be back in Astoria before you know it. Totally. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's ridiculous. Like they really, no loyalty whatsoever to those who stayed and, and no, no, they sucked don't it care. up and dealt and kept things going. It's really not fair. Yeah, we no. had, wasn't it, didn't Melissa like renegotiated her lease back during COVID? She was on the upper, another yeah. uh, employee at um, Kaufman and uh, she's on the Upper East Side and she was able to get it knocked down a good deal. But yeah, she's kind of worried about the renewal. Now. Uh, that, right, exactly. That's what I was yeah. going to say. We don't know yet. That's annoying. Uh, my, my husband's like um, the director. He's like, sends me texts. Tascam. Oh, thank you, Slavka. Tascam is the name of the stupid red thingy that you record the sound into that I can never remember. And I literally just have to always ask him. And he's always like, Tascam. I think it's like one of the things he has automatically programmed in his phone to text me. Because <laughs> like, what's the name of that thing? And now he's like, move a little so you're not behind the mic. <laughs> <laughs> that's a true partnership though that's great <laughs> my, my yes my astrophysicist slash director um all right let's get started and i will press record so that we make sure we get it so welcome everybody to the Astoria film festival career fair uh, we are here with Michael Fodera, Faye Samaris, and Kyle Stockberger thank you so much you guys for joining me uh, to talk about different film careers, TV careers, and how you get into this industry in general, how you've done it. Um, we work with a lot of high school students and middle school students and college students who are all, you know, I think the entertainment industry has so many different paths. People kind of trip their way in. <laughs> you know, I think the word luck has been used a lot the past few days. Um, and, you know, so I think it, it's helpful to hear people's different experiences to, to understand what yours might be like, or, you know, understand when, and people always say, oh, you have to take the opportunities when they're in front of you, but how do you know, right? Like, how do you know what's a good opportunity? What's a scam? What's going to set you back? It's really hard when you're kind of making those decisions. So thank you for helping us to help them figure out how to make those decisions. Um, if you want to just kind of say your name and give a little, and um, by the way, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, I am a white woman with dark black hair and pink glasses and a pink sweater. And I'm in front of a Astoria Film Festival banner and a bookcase. So if you guys can just introduce yourselves, what you do and uh, all that jazz. Mike, do you wanna go? Uh, sure, my name is Mike Federa. My pronouns are he, him and his. Uh, I'm a white man, I'm bald, but I'm wearing a hat. <laughs> uh, with a nerdy Apollo 1960s logo uh, on the top of it. Um, I'm based in Astoria. I'm an independent filmmaker. I do a lot of freelance work. And my day job, I'm a senior video producer at Squarespace. Very cool. Yeah. Faye? Hello, I am Faye Samaras, and I'm a stage manager over at Kaufman Astoria Studios. I uh, was born and raised in Astoria, but a few mm -hmm. years ago, several years ago, yes, <laughs> I too. got married and moved over to Bayside, but I am so happy to be working and still in Astoria every single day. Um, she, her, hers, by the way, is uh, my, uh, are my pronouns, rather. Um, and I guess as far as introductions go, that's about it. I'll save the rest for later. Cool. Kyle? I agree. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Kyle Stockberger. My, my pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, I'm also a white, a bald guy, but I am not wearing a hat. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of show posters in the background. I'm a, a theater person was sort of my, my uh, background and I'm recently transitioning into film. Um, and I have was a day that job. Was that kind of COVID inspired, the film transition? 
You know, I think it actually, um, I, there's always been an interest and always been a, a desire to do that. And oddly enough, COVID sort of presented the opportunity, um, which it was you the know, kick I, in the pants that pushed you towards it regardless. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, we can definitely speak more to that later, but um, yeah, my, my day job has absolutely nothing to do with the arts. I work for a nonprofit that um, helps with affordable housing, which is ironic given we were just talking about rent raises um, in yes. the city. So. Yes, the uh, the disloyal landlords who uh, are now raising the rent on everybody who stayed here <laughs> through yeah. thick and thin. <laughs> yeah, not cool yeah. people. Not nope. cool. Um, Adam just popped up for a second. If you want to join us, Adam's actually going to co-host with me. Um, so, but then he went away. You want to come back, Adam? If you want, if you're up for it. Yay! There you are. You want to just introduce yourself. Sure. My name is Adam. I go to Orange Design High School. I'm a junior. I'm going out here. And you're studying film. What's your favorite part of filmmaking? Do you prefer like screenwriting, directing, editing? I think I like all, all of them, basically. I think <laughs> my favorite is directing. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> all right. So st starting, do you want to start us off with the first question, Adam? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. One second. Do you want me to start off with the first question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So the, the first question is <laughs> starting with Kyle and kind of working backwards is um, how did you get into filmmaking? or your current path? Like how, how did you get into the current job you're in? What, what jobs have you had along the way? And like, you know, kind of understanding that path might help others figure out their own path. Yeah, so I guess sort of the, the Cliff Notes version, I was thinking about it earlier today. Um, you know, I've always been interested in storytelling. Um, and even as a little kid, I used to make up store, you know, do plays in my room. Uh, and so I think, you know, that really manifested through acting. So for a long time, you know, starting with children's theater through high school, got a BFA in theater performance, and then got an MFA in acting. So that was really kind of the backbone of my creative practice for a long time. Um, but there was always that part of me that was really interested in storytelling and always interested in writing. Um, and I think, you know, the more I've been out of grad school for about 10 years, and the more I've sort of been in the quote unquote real world, uh, <laughs> the more I've, I've realized, uh, you know, not only the need within me to, to be more of a storyteller and more of taking the driver's seat, but also just the necessity in terms of making opportunities for myself. Um, yes, and yes. Yeah, so that, I mean, essentially, I started writing plays, and then I you know, uh, wrote this short, short um, screenplay. Uh, and then, you know, like I said, it, it wasn't until COVID and everything shut down that it, it was able to happen, which was just, I mean, it really was like a, there were the universe, the planets aligning. Um, we were really lucked out because it, you know, it was a small two person cast outside one location. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that's that's sort of the general overview of my path is acting, studied acting in, in school. Um, you know, here here in New York, I've done some off-off Broadway type things, which, were, you know, I always joke with a couple of my friends. It's like, if there's a, a black box theater downtown, like I've probably been there, you know, and <laughs> the, it, a lot of times it wasn't getting paid. And then there were times where I was getting paid and, you know, but it was, I think, the equity, like the base contract, it's like two hundred dollars a week. So obviously, can't wow, really. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. <laughs> we so, we talked to somebody yesterday who said that, like back in the eighties, they they took a job and they were like, and it was only paying one thirty a week. So that's kind of a, <laughs> it's making this sound, you know, that make this is making that sound a lot better. Yeah, yeah. So 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 that's that's you know I, I that's how how I've been paid or compensated, you know, as an artist, but, um, you know, that, that said, I, I, I have a day job and luckily it affords me the, uh, you know, the chance to be able to kind of do my own thing outside of work. So it's, you know, the hustle for sure, but I'm, I'm still hustling. Yeah. I, I have a day job in addition to the festival. So I completely <laughs> yeah. understand. 
<laughs> Faye, how, uh, what was your path like? So I mean, you're um, a Kaufman baby. You basically were like born in Kaufman. Right? I, I I am. Um, and I tried to get in years earlier, <laughs> could not. Um, so it, it kind of, for me, it, it kind of happened over time. Right. So my mother has been working here for, um, 25 years or a little over 20, was she Kaufman's 20 years at some point? I'm sorry. Was she Mr. Kaufman's assistant at some point? No, she was um, somebody else's assistant when she came in. I was really young, right? I'm not sure who's. Um, and then, you know, now she's, uh, she was a million hats here, HR, office manager, assistant, yes. the president. Um, so, you know, I would come and visit her all the time. And even as a girl, I was always in so, such an awe of the studio walking in, like my eyes would go wide with excitement, you know, and um Thanks to her, I did have the opportunity to intern during high school a couple of summers here, um, you know, or here and there, you know, a few hours during the week or on spring break to make a couple of bucks. Um, and I would always, so I, I ended up pursuing a bachelor's, I completed a bachelor's in psychology and um, I would pester her and I'd be like, you know, I didn't know what exactly I wanted to do. I knew I, I wanted to be in psychology, but there's just so many lanes that you can uh, take after mm -hmm. that. So I was thinking, you know, okay, HR, um, like, let me get in there. Let me get right. in there. I want to work there. And there was just, this is such an excellent place to work, um, that nobody really is. Right. right. So there were, there were no openings, uh, whatsoever. Um, so, uh, but I did then meet, uh, one of the tenants here when I was uh, in undergrad, is a psychiatrist. So after a few conversations with her, she took me in and I worked, I had a paid internship in her office uh, for a little while. And so coming here every day, even though I wasn't working for the studio at the time, I was working for somebody else. I would just, you know, I'd walk in and every day I'd think to myself like, oh God, like I could really get used to coming in here every day forever. <laughs> I, I just, I still love this place so much. You know, then I went on to grad school um, I decided ultimately to pursue a master's in school counseling. Um, and so that took me out to LIU on Long Island. And with the practicum hours, I was not really able to uh, come in uh, mm -hmm. here. So I, I left with her, but I did need something still, right? And then I ended up working at Macy's, uh, a Macy's store in Long Island in their offices for about two and a half, three years. Um, ironically, so then with my practicum hours for grad school, I was unable to do anything because I had to work school hours. And ironically, they then offered me an HR job, which wow. I turned down. Which is I was great, a semester then you away get the from experience. graduating. So yeah. I was like, oh, I can't throw that away now. Um, you know, immediately after after uh, graduating, I worked at Briarcliff College, uh, Long Island. Uh, it is a it was a privately owned college, and a year in, the company shut the college down. Oh wow! To be the last one in my department, I was the first one out. Um, and there I was looking for work, and you know it was, I think it was about April. That was my last day there. It was the end of the spring semester, and you know right at around that time, about a month later. Ma, uh, Pete Romano, who is the vice president of operations here at the studio, was informed that his assistant was moving out of state. And so it was one of those like very organic, like, hey, you've been here, you know what the deal is. Help me for a couple of months while you're looking for work, because anything you find won't start until September anyway. And, right, you know, right. we'll, we'll both figure it out. Uh, and in the meantime, we're, you know, helping each other out. And so I was like, yeah, great. Sure. Why not? You know, uh, <laughs> those two months, it's, you know, six years and a promotion later, I'm still <laughs> here. but it's just so funny to me. It's, it's beautiful. The way life, the, the journey and the path that life takes you on, if you just go with it, you know, yeah. just go with it from a little girl walking in here, like, Oh, I love this place. You know, to trying to get my foot in the door and, and in any way possible to, you know, look at how it happened. Just, I don't, know, I don't want to say luck, but <laughs> you know that, I mean, luck has a lot to do with it. I mean, everybody's yeah. working hard. Everybody's, you know, doing what their best, but um, then things come up and it, timing is great. Is the thing too, right? The timing yeah. of it all. 
what um how you just became stage manager how did you know that was kind of what you wanted to go for so um you know i really when i came in i was peak mono's assistant so i was the executive assistant for the operations department which basically meant that i had to learn the role of absolutely everybody from the top to bottom right because I was the person that was the, the liaison for everyone. So I have to know, you know, who does what, when, and where, and how in order to make everything work cohesively, uh, efficiently, seamlessly. Um, so in that, I realized that my interest was really piqued in working more closely with the productions and their needs and how they operate, uh, not only their need, their operational needs, but how they can work together and within our the studio's operational needs. And so I just really made sure that I was proactive and that I showed my interest and I was vocal about my interests. Mm-hmm. And when the opportunity came around, you know, it was, I was lucky and not even lucky enough. I want to say, you know, grateful that they even uh, offered it to me immediately before, you know, looking. So yeah, um, it's something that I think I made pretty well known. <laughs> <laughs> I say you're not shy, so I could no. <laughs> say speaking it. But uh, also, I think I, I'll if I go out at all in Astoria, like, and people ask me what I do, like, I was at a bar not too long ago. People, bartender was like, "So what do you do?" And I said, "Oh, Astoria Film Festival." They said, "Oh, that's a Kaufman." I said, "Yeah." They're like, "So do you work for Kaufman?" No, they're our sponsor. So why don't Kaufman have like a page of job listings? And I'm like, you don't understand. Like, Kaufman is a landlord. Like, they're <laughs> they, 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 the majority of people around think that Kaufman like hires the PAs and hires the directors, right. right? I'm like, they're not a production company. They're landlords. They're renting the studios to production companies, right? So, if you want to work on a production, you got to come in. Yeah. So, I think I literally made a TikTok about it because I was like, people, <laughs> like, stop asking me this question. There's like <laughs> ten employees for Kaufman. <laughs> like, there's <laughs> it's a tiny group of people who run the buildings, mm-hmm. and then the production company companies rent the space from them like it's not correct you know so I think people are very uh, don't understand that at all (laughs) yeah no we get I get calls multiple times a week for that and then you know I also can't they you know they get frustrated because then they go well transfer me to them can't I really can't it's I'm not allowed to you know I said you know a lot lot of the productions have like legal you know non-disclosure agreements but they don't want people to know they're filming while they're filming so it's not like they're going to be able to tell you oh so and so is filming here right so right right exactly anywho (laughs) Mike oh wait did did I already you already uh, gave yeah sorry <laughs> oh I, I i didn't answer that question yet oh okay no go ahead yeah. then. Uh, i actually you actually just inadvertently brought up a very embarrassing memory for me when i first was trying to get into production i didn't try to apply <laughs> to a job at kaufman but you know um Haddad's trailers you see all over the city yes yes not knowing anything about production i remember like writing a very detailed like here's my resume it's my dream to be a director and like thinking that these people were going to do it but like i didn't know any better but like i totally repressed that memory until just now i'm so sorry (laughs) it's cool it's cool hey that this is how you learn um I kind of went about it in a little bit of a zigzag. Um, I went to school for photography at School of Visual Arts, and I really loved photography while I was there. I was doing a lot of like fine art. It was weird. One of my teachers once commented that my photos looked like a film, like because it was just like this like cinematic, like kind of surreal thing. Um, and my head was always sort of into like what producer was doing what with what writer, rather than my friends at school were like, oh, this. This artist is showing at this gallery and I kind of just didn't care. Yes, yes. Um, but like there was a few different routes to go after college and I fought really hard to get an internship at Newsweek magazine. And I know I'm dating myself, but in 2007, before the recession, uh, magazines were like still a really prestigious place to like work. So I got a, I got a job in the photo department and that's pretty seeing, funny that you have to say that. Like that I do because, occur to me to say. <laughs> because like when I've told people before, it's just like a blank slate. I'm like, that was like a big deal. But then 2008 recession happened and like. Yeah, everything journal- changed. Journalism lost its luster a little bit. I'll just say that. Um, uh, and so I was meeting a lot of amazing photographers who were 
like incredible at their craft. Like some people were just getting off the plane from Afghanistan and coming right to the office. Some people had like just shot Ben Stiller on, on like the set. Um, and I was watching the amount of like grinding they were doing for their job. And I'm like, something just didn't click. I'm like, I, I don't mind working hard, but like something, I don't know, just like something about this just didn't work. And at the same time, a very good friend of mine, um, his name is Frank Sabatella. He got major funding for a horror film. And he's like, hey, dude, I know you're looking for work. Do you want to be my set photographer on my film? It's like done. Like it's it's a it's a paying job. I get to hang out with a friend. I've never seen a film before, you know, and it was probably like the biggest gift I could ever get because I wasn't a PA. So I wasn't like first one in, last one out, (laughs) making coffee, driving trucks, doing all the sorry, the crap work, but like, Hey, you have to start somewhere. There's nothing wrong with being a PA, but, but I was truly a fly on the wall, just doing what I knew how to do is just take pictures. And they, it was like day 13 or day 14 on the shoot. And I hadn't missed a day of work. And they pulled me aside. Like one of the producers, they're like, Hey, Mike, I thought I was in trouble. They're like, Mike, we only have like 15 days of pay for you. (laughs) And I was like, I don't care. And I worked like the extra, like it was a 35 day shoot. And I worked the rest of it for free. Um, and then that was it. Like, I was just like, oh, I want to direct. And I liked writing in high school, but I just really started writing. So I had something to direct as silly as that sound. And then once wow, you kind of get- I think that's how you do it. Like, yeah, that's I mean, literally I, how you do it. Yeah, like I knew the, the transferring the skills of photography wasn't a crazy bridge to cross to filmmaking. And especially like being on set, you kind of saw how to do it like on an indie set. Um, but it was really like, oh, I just need a story and like, okay, let me write this story myself. And then once I got bit with the bug of writing, I'm like, I don't think any filmmaker, I think every filmmaker has probably written more than they've actually produced. So I've probably written way, way more that's ever been shot. Um, and yeah, I mean, it just kind of sprawled from there. I, I did, um, I still love, I'm still, I'm trying to make my first feature film, um, but I've done a few short, a handful of shorts. I started picking up freelance, which is a big shift for me about eight years ago. And then about three and a half years ago, um, when I got the job at Squarespace, they were looking for a video producer. And then I was like, Hey, at my day job, I was like doing project management and team, uh, people management. And they're like, Oh my God, we need a a team lead. Do you want to do that instead? Like, I was like, does it pay more? They're like, yeah. I was like, okay. (laughs) Like that's like a no brainer. Um, and that has been a really great lesson in, a lot of ways but like it's a great phenomenal place to work and then on the side i'm able they're very open with me to like i did a freelance job last year and i'll probably pick up a couple more jobs this year and it's just it's it's a it's kind of like best of both worlds where it's like i get to play with toys all day even though it's kind of like on a marketing advertising product based kind of thing which is still a great thing to do like they gave yeah. me a studio but on the flip side uh, as long as i'm not working for any of the competitors which I will never, uh, uh, they're super cool with me taking any freelance gig that I need to. So that's great. Cause they're not, yeah. companies aren't always open to that. I've, I've heard horror stories that if you film for one, if like you're under contract for one thing, like don't ever ask to film for anything or, or you better just like keep your head down. Hope you don't get noticed. Like, yes. yeah. So yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, what, um, Kind of touched on this a bit, but like, what what's a project you've worked on that you were really proud of in over the or over time, or you could be working on now that you're really excited about? Either or. Is back Mike, to me again. Want to start? Okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, actually, um, Prisoner sixteen sixteen, which um, I'm very my best drama at art. Yeah, it won the uh, Grand Jury Prize too. Oh, sorry. Film Festival. No, no, no I'm. I'm uh, that was like a gargantuan effort that is, it's a proof of concept for my feature film. So it's like, I'm, I'm, it's going to have mileage to it. And it also functions as a short, um, but it like made me grow as a producer because I was an annoying son of a bitch to get my cast and crew in an actual prison. And we filmed just before the pandemic too, because I think had the pandemic happen, even if we had all the money in the world, they wouldn't let us in. Uh, for like our short so it took a a huge effort before the pandemic and we filmed it and then I we were at you know the whole world went into lockdown uh, and we were at home with my three-year-old she's gonna be five but yeah 
three-year-old. So I was handling editing and I was just thinking, oh, once you kind of get the editing thing going, you'll be fine. Once I kind of got out of my head from the pandemic and worked on it, it was like such a crazy effort post-production that I totally underestimated. Um, and I, it definitely pushed me pre-production, production and post-production has like pushed me into like a different area that I was not before. So I'm super, super proud of that project. How so? Like how has it pushed you? Um, stretching a dollar, not letting anybody sort of infringe on like a vision without being an egotistical ass about it. Um, like you kind of have to fight for your vision, but not because it's your vision. It's just like, no, I want it this way because the story, like Rudy's character is supposed to be like this. And like, you know, just really paying attention to the details and, and keeping the core of the story, driving the ship rather than I'm the director, listen to me. It's like, right, there's a million right. of those people and they're all disposable. And any high schoolers listening right now, don't be one of those people, be, you know, focus on the story. Um, and yeah, I mean, like it, it's, it was, it was also the biggest budget I had ever dealt with too. Um, but it was just a lot of moving pieces and a lot of great people putting their uh, effort in, but just kind of like managing a lot of so many moving parts um and i'm super proud of it too um it was kind of like the first time i had jumped into sci-fi too even though i'm like a diehard twilight zone fan um everybody was just like we can't believe you didn't do sci-fi sooner but um yeah just a really definitely like kind of like uh setting a little bit more of like my north star making that movie so and you had won best comedy short the year before and that was a brilliant movie as well. And I, I found, at least with the shorts and the festival, comedy is very hard. Like comedy is very hard to do and not be insulting and not, you know, like it, it's uh, it, it not be too slapsticky or too silly. And, or, you know, but you, you hit a perfect like it was very well done. It's oh, thank you. Yeah, that film was called Yikes. And that was uh, that was shot entirely in Astoria. Um, very, very pre if, if I had a choice. I would shoot everything in Astoria also because I'm kind of lazy and I don't want to travel too Thanks. far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, that, that was, that was another fun one. Cause that was actually the first film that I, uh, it was a skeleton crew, but I, I like pushed for the Kickstarter to get enough money just to get that crew because you operate differently. You're you, the, every frame will change immediately. As soon as you have like a team behind you that kind of cares and believes in the project. So Absolutely. yeah. Faye, favorite project, proudest moment, whatever you want to share. So, you know, I can't say that there's one particular project uh, or production that we've had here that really stands out because it's all, um, all fun to me, always kind of. Um, but I guess my proudest moment would be, you know, finally um, getting this promotion and coming into my role because, you know, like I said earlier, it was, um, I had to learn a little bit of what everybody did in both worlds on the production side of things, on the studio side of things, you know? Um, and so, uh, I think I am most proud of, of my proactivity in getting myself to this point. Um, yeah. you know, and it's I, hard. I truly, it's hard to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And this is definitely, I mean, it was my favorite part of the job when I, uh, started here and, and started learning what it takes to run a facility like this um, and learning, you know, what the needs like I said, of a production are. So, you know, now I get to, first of all, this definitely gets me away from my uh, desk and office a little more. And, you know, um, a lot of liaising with producers, taking them on tours, working on the contracts, you know, but I still have to know like our HVAC information and mm -hmm. like right. all these random things that I never would have imagined myself, you know, hey, yes, I know that, you know, right, um, right. like snake waste information and like <laughs> internet and phone stuff. Like I never would have imagined myself knowing all these things, but I think that's my favorite part of it is that it's there's just so much. And I yes, realized yes. and learned over time that I am, um, I, I, I enjoy putting all the pieces of a puzzle, so to speak, together and being the one to kind of say like, okay, let's get this done. It just puts me in a go mode that yeah. I truly, truly enjoy. So, um, you know, I guess. Mm. 
It's if I like, had to say a favorite. It's like Sister Mihaly's flow, right? It's that you, you flow, that idea in psychology where you kind of get into that place where you're just like in the zone. And yes. that, that feels so good. And I think yes. sets are like that for filmmakers. Right. Your, you know, where you are is like that for you. I think right. that's a yes. great place to be. 100%. But, you know, if I had to pick, I guess, um, one favorite, I would say there's a few favorites. There was one period of time here uh, that we had on every single stage, there was a, a jail set. <laughs> <laughs> like Did you have orange the new black? So we had orange, we had um, escape at Denim Hora at <laughs> that time. Uh, and then shades of blue at the same <laughs> time. They had altogether taken up pretty much everything. And it was just every stage I walked on everywhere I turned was a jail cell. <laughs> so it was a fun time uh, because, you know, you still walked around and, yeah. and, you know, be pre-COVID when we could just kind of, walk you know, around. walk yeah. in. Um, so that was, that was a fun period of time here. But yeah, I'm um, just, um, it's, it's always it's always fun, no matter what project you have. Production. I know Pete has all his stories of like people calling him at home for toilet paper. and. Oh, my God. From the smallest request like that. Yeah. To the largest. It's like like I celebrities, by like, the way, please it, it, complete my cell contract. phone ringing <laughs> during dinner. And it's like some major <laughs> celebrity like I mean, I'm with the toilet paper. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. who's this? <laughs> yeah. But we are a full service facility. So, you know, you do it all. You, that's what you need. If I've got it, then it's yours. Yes, indeed. Kyle. Yeah, I, I mean, I would have to say uh, Tom's Bench, which is the short film I, uh, it, it presented at Astoria Film Festival is uh, definitely very special to me. And I think, you know, everyone involved, it was very much um, a labor of love and it, it did come together. We, we filmed in October of 2020 and so it, it was kind of sort of between the waves you know we had that yes. kind of like summer reprieve yes, I before. Understand. yeah I mean uh, that's why we moved our festivals to October we used to have them in June May June kind of but um during COVID I was like all right let's when COVID hit I was like all right push it to October and then there were, we could kind of get it done but then it started up again like so we just kept it in October ever since because of that yeah yeah so it, it really worked out and I think everyone was sort of in this place because there were a lot of people involved who were theater artists. And so obviously theater is just, was just totally shut down. So to be able to come together and do something creative was very healing. Um, and I, I think for me as, as sort of a self-producing artist, it was, it was very empowering to sort of, you know, I, I guess just a little bit of background, you know, when I, when I was in grad school at Cal Arts, we had a, a student theater where you could essentially put up your own work. And, and I did a lot of my own shows there and uh, that was very rewarding. And then I sort of got to the real world and it was, you know, quote unquote, real world. I mean, it's all the real world, but, yes, uh, but yeah, you know, you don't have those resources of an institution, you know, you suddenly you have to pay for rehearsal space, you have to pay for performance space. I mean, it's just all these sort of logistics that you don't think about when you're in school. Um, and so, you know, I think this is something I have to give myself credit for is, you know, I got to New York and, you know, there luckily there are certain sort of um, some of those off off Broadway indie theaters, you know, that do support live performance and it is part of their mission to help emerging artists present their work. Um, but I definitely had to learn how to like, A, ask for help, you know, because mm, I was sort of this yes. like one man show for a while. And it's yes. just, not only is it like not really sustainable, I mean, there is, it also brings up that point of like being an egomaniac. Although, I, you know, I think it was more, <laughs> more of like, I just didn't really know what I was doing. And I thought I had to do it on my own. Um, but then you know, what happened with Tom's Bench is is an actor who I'd been in a show with. Uh, he ended up doing, um, we did like a stage reading of it. And then he he was the one that was like, I think we can produce this as a film. And so having that like creative partner come on board. And then I I reached out to another friend from school who I, I, I knew had done a short and he became the director. And so it was kind of like all these people sort of came together and kind of brought their expertise. And we you know, we didn't necessarily know what we were doing, but we we found people who had done done it before and and just, you know, uh, bought them coffee or whatever, had a phone call. And um, and then the actual day of the shoot, it was just it just really felt like kismet. You know, the weather was gorgeous. It was, you know, um, 
and, and, you know, it was a small crew and we were just able to really just focus on telling the story and making the art. And it felt really, really healing. And, you know, I think what I love about film now is that we have this thing, we have this, this piece of art or, you know, that just sort of exists that lives on. Whereas like with theater, you know, right. there've been right. times where I've done the same amount of work for a staged reading and then it's like over like that. Um, yes. So yeah, that's, that's, that. I mean, like I said, there's always been that part of me that's been interested in storytelling and, and filmmaking, but now I'm really like, oh, I see, you You know, I see I why see this benefits. is so alluring. Yeah. 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 I think that came through though. The, the, the catharsis of it kind of came through in the telling in the film itself. I think that's why it was so lovely because you all were very much like, you seem just really happy to be doing it <laughs> you know that joy came through the film very much so thank you thank you um, so yeah. a lot of our students on the our next question are um it was, at least half of our students that i've heard over the years ask me like do i do i have to go to college like you know my family doesn't have the money for it i don't have the money to, i don't want to go into debt should I just get a job working, especially in entertainment, like get, get a job as a PA, you know, et cetera. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? College or work or both or how, I mean, you know, what are your thoughts? I won't start. Kyle, if you want to start us off. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a I have a lot of thoughts. I was thinking about this and I, you know, I I've become much more transparent about the amount of student loan debt I have just mm. because I feel like, yeah, I think that's why we're in the problem we're in is, Absolutely. you know, the situation is I mean, that's was, the main reason it's like they're not lazy. They just don't want to they, they can't their families can't do it for them and they don't know if that's worth it, you know. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, it, it is, a, it is a crisis. I think student debt, I mean, I, I will just say it, like I've got almost $200,000 in student loan debt and that's sort of with interest accrued from having to defer because I, you know, couldn't pay my monthly whatever. And so, so that, you know, that's like a huge number and I keep sort of praying that they're going to cancel the student debt, yes. but, um, yes. cancel you know, student debt, cancel yeah. student debt. And I don't have student debt. I just think it's a stupid thing to to ruin the economy over, right? Like, yeah, cancel yeah. student debt. Take the Jeff Bezos money, cancel student debt. Right? I know, like, right? Why does he need another ten billion? <laughs> um, so, so it's tough because on one hand, I do have that sort of hanging over my head, and it it is kind of this like almost in some ways it's like almost laughable because I'm like, well, how am I ever going to pay that? Um, and, and there is part of me that does think like, wow, I. I wish I hadn't done that. You know, I wish I hadn't done that. But right. at, at the same time, I look at like everything that I've done since school. I mean, and this might just be because of my, because I did go to school, like every theater thing I've done, every film thing I've done, I think, except for maybe one project has been because of a relationship I met uh, at, with someone I went to school with. And, and I think the real value of school is it does build community so that it's like you have friends that are sort of in the same boat as you with similar passions and similar interests. Um, and, you know, I think it, as a creative person, it helped me, art, you know, really articulate like what my interests are, what my passions are, how to be able to communicate that to others. Um, so, you know, in, in that sense, I feel like school is worth it. And I, you know, I, I, I am sort of, you know, I went to my undergrad at like a big state college. So I wasn't just studying theater. So I had the other, you know, at the time, I didn't want to take these classes that weren't theater. But I think in, in hindsight, I can sort of see like as an artist, I think having things that aren't, you know, out, everything in life, like it, it inspires my art, influences my art. So I think having some of those sort of, you know, I was just thinking about like, I took a course on Russian history, which obviously, you know, right now is like very sort of like, wow, I'm really glad I took that course. Um, uh, but what am I, you know, it's, it's tough. Cause I, yeah, it's, I can sort of see both sides of it. Cause I also know people who started out as PAs and worked their way up to, to, yeah, to having a freelance career as a, as a producer or whatever. Um, so I think it's just, you know, it's, it's, I, I guess if I had to say one thing, it, you know, part of it was when I was coming out of high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. 
And so having college to sort of figure that out helped. It was kind of like training wheels. Um, And then grad school, I I did feel a bit more focused of like, no, I really do want to develop these skills. But I think a lot of it is, you know, it's, it's like the, the intuition thing and like knowing like what it is you want. And if you don't know what you want, give yourself time to figure that out. Um, and, right. and yeah, just think about it before you take on all that debt. Cause in my mind, I was like, well, I'll make a movie, you know, I'll, right. and I'll get like, it'll all be million. paid off in five yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. Which hasn't happened yet. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I often tell the kids like who are uns- uncertain and worried, you know, maybe work for a year, work for a year, see if, try to get a job in what you want to do or an internship and see if that's the path you want to take. Right. And then I don't think there's a rush to go to college. I think take a year or two in between and, you know, you will gain experience and life skills that are necessary for growth anyway. And then you can always decide to go back. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, if, if you want, but once you're, you know, or, or you may get a job with a company that might actually pay for college, right. They, they, they exist. So um, yeah, that's kind of usually, or I say like, pick the cheapest option you have, like whatever, whatever you get into that gives you the most aid, go there. Like, don't worry about where you go, just go to the cheapest option because it really doesn't matter in the long run. You know, and I think I say that having gone to Harvard because coming out of Harvard, A, they were my cheapest option because we were so poor that we got a lot of aid <laughs> relative to the other people at Harvard. And B, um, it, it didn't really make a difference. Like I did, they did not get me like um, my future jobs. Like they were very, it very much has not helped me in my career path. So um, I feel like, oh, it was all kind of a lie. <laughs> like it was all, everybody was lying about this whole like, school will get you everywhere kind of mentality well and that's the thing too is like it's not the institute you know it's not cal arts that's gotten me jobs it's the people i met there so in some ways it's like it really is the people so it's like it doesn't matter if the people are at some fancy private art school or if they're at you know wherever As, as long as you're building relationships you know with people who are driven and share similar interests and passions and i think i would agree with that Definitely. Faye, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I agree. Um, some of the things I, I like noted what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and, um, you know, some of the points that I wanted to make are both brought up, you know, there's, there's really not one correct answer or one right, right path, you know, um, it, it doesn't have to be just one. It doesn't have to be just the other. It doesn't have to be both. It could be, you know, whatever. And also there's really no requirement for what order you do that. So exactly. Yeah, if you exactly. want to work for a year, take a gap year or two, you know, they, everybody used to tell you, you know, like you take a gap year, you're not going to go back. That is yes, that's not true. That's not another true lie, right? It's not true. Um, it doesn't matter if you go back when you're 40, 50, 60, like you can go back whenever you want. It's fine. Right. Yep. Um, that's the beauty of life what you want really at the end of the day um and uh you know for somebody though who really has their heart set on that college experience because yes it's the people like Kyle said that that create that experience and that could help you down the line right uh those connections that you make this is where the school counselor in me comes in I was go saying, this, yes. talk to your school counselor sit with them take the time you know Sometimes they may feel, you know, you may feel like, oh, but they've got so many students and, you know, it's probably the same spiel. No, if you show them that you really, really, you know, want to do this, they will take the time, they will help you, they will give you the resources. Ask a million questions, call the colleges that you're interested in and ask yeah, them what I programs think they might have. Very important. Yeah, you know, look up scholarships, look up, you know, and if everything, apply to a million of them, do all of it and just, you know, see what comes back to you. You never, you never know. And then there's also, you know, before I um, went to Queens College, which is where I, I went for my bachelor's, I started at a, commu- a local community college because that was the cheaper option and I said okay well I know I'm going to need these core courses one way or the other and while I'm still figuring out what I want to do I may as well go with the cheapest option um that I have you know save my money see if I like it or not and take it from there Um, but but on the other hand if you know 100% what you want to do 
and how you plan to get there and that does not require school, there's nothing wrong with that. Go for it, do it, you know, right. absolutely right. do it. I think ultimately, um, you know, I really believe everybody needs to follow their instinct or their gut, right? Um, and I read somewhere, this is one of the things I want to brought up. I can't remember where I read it and I, might, I hope I don't say this wrong, I might say it wrong, but somebody brought up, you know, in regards to following your instinct, because somebody might say, well, I don't know what my gut says, or I don't know what my instinct is, you know, like I'm kind of torn between two things, toss a coin. Well, that coin is coming down from the air you will know your gut will tell you what it is what you want it to land on. Yes. I tried that. (laughs) I thought so I can make all these big decisions, but when it comes to dinner, I'm like, (laughs) Oh, (laughs) right. So, so I read this and and I did, and I told the kind of on the way down, I go, Oh, wow. That, that really like, it scared me. It works. You, you realize (laughs) in that instant, in that moment of pressure, like which way you're hoping that coin is going to fall, you know? So kind of sounds silly, but No, I, I love say, that. I say it works. <laughs> I love that. And I like the fact that you, you're talking like you dinner. Know, follow your gut. It's whatever's for you. And, you know, either way, just put your best foot, your best foot forward. And that's it. Absolutely. I love that. Mike? Um, I'm going to echo both Faye and Kyle. Um, there's not one specific answer, but I would say whatever you're going to do, just commit 100%. Because you, yep. if, if college is not the, uh, the, the answer or the option even, there's another million routes to go and you shouldn't feel pigeonholed to go. I've also met people who go to school just to go to more school and they still don't know what the hell they're doing. And there's, there's nothing wrong with not knowing what you want to do, but don't get in the trap of getting graduating and then paying for more school to get your master's and you're still not going to know. I know people who have done that. I also have known people who have gone to go get their master's in like filmmaking or photography and they're really good. And these are the people who are like touring the world and like, that's fine, whatever, but they're committing a hundred percent. The only plus I'll say about college is that it does give you an environment to learn a set of skills that there's not, uh, forgive the saying, there's not a gun against your head to learn it. Whereas if you're going to jump on set as a PA, you really need to know what you're doing because like somebody's paying for that set or the time or something. And you can learn on your feet, be a PA, watch if you, if you're interested in being behind the camera or a stylist or a wardrobe or whatever, learn and watch and just, do that and then say, Hey, I really like to try to go into that. But, um, just th- that, that's the one plus that I'll say, like the connections in college and it is giving you, uh, I think Kyle said it before, like, you don't think about what goes into like rehearsal space and this and that. So you have the time to like rent that camera from the rental, fr- from the, the equipment booth to say like, Oh, I want to try this lens today, or I want to try this, or I want to try that. Whereas in the real world, that, that, day of shooting might cost you easily $600 in equipment for like a 24, yeah, Yeah. 24 hour period. So there's, there is a trade-off, but like the people who I know who are doing really big things, uh, basically it's like, it's really true. Whatever you put in, you get out. If you want to go to college, whatever you put in, you get out. If you want to not go to college and just do it on your set, do it on the set, just do that. Um, also, one other little thing, just be prepared to work for free just to get your ass on set, because that's the thing that kind of gets your your resume a little bit people. And then they remember you and then like, oh, no, we have a budget this time. We'll get you on. Like, just if you want to see to get to get it and learn how it's done with like a crew, even if they're a completely new crew, that's like a year older than you. Just be prepared to work for free. And that's kind of that, that's the only, you know, so even if you go to college, be prepared to work for free. Yeah, so, I say. yeah. Yeah. College doesn't prevent that from happening. And, and no. also, I think if, if you're going to go into something, whether it's an internship or, you know, you're volunteering your, your services, be committed, like you were saying, because, um, you know, we get a lot of interns who sometimes are kind of half in, half out, don't really want, and then they come back, they're like, oh, can you give me a recommendation? I'm like, based on what? What did you right. do? <laughs> you know, so I would say, if you want a recommendation, like if, if this is going to mean something you have to put something into it so that there's something to take away from it right like it's not just you don't just sit there that's not going to help anybody yeah and, and i don't know the 
the contacts you make in school are important, but like you're also make if you're on set working, you're making contacts there too. So it's like, yes, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I felt like my I had to go to work, get experiences, and then those led to the next experiences. Those led to the next experiences. Like, it the the school did not carry me into any job. You know, it was the last experience that carried me into the next experience. One hundred percent. Just to jump back to that horror director that I that gave me the first job. After I made my first short, and I can't believe I got paid to make my first uh, music video. It was really 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 low budget and I think I even <laughs> lost money on the deal um I had asked him I was like hey because he went to NIFA um yep. and I was like hey like I'm really like enjoying what I'm doing like should I you think I should go to NIFA to like maybe I don't know bulk up on some skills and he just like cut me off he's like dude you're doing what like people getting out of NIFA are trying to do he's like you're gonna like keep going like that's how you learn but like don't so just to kind of put that in perspective, if you're doing it, you don't need to go to school to learn how to do it. Yeah, so. I think we felt we I've worked with a lot of kids who do film high school programs that are so intense that they go to college film programs and they're like, I, I did this, you know, like, so I, I yeah. know, you know, part, one of the things our design tries to do is kind of get some of the kids credits in certain colleges so that they don't have to redo all the basics and kind of can explore more but it it you know yeah if, if you're doing it you're doing it wherever you're doing it yeah yeah so on that note if you could go back to your 18 year old self and give him advice what would you say i would say don't be afraid to put the work in and every every uh positive like step up in my career or just even my skill base or experience has been because I put the work in and I've like cared about the project. Every time that I've sort of been like, that little carrot has dangled in front of me from either like a person who thought they were an agent or a manager and sort of like uh, gave me that little like, oh, you're gonna, you get to cut the line right now and you're gonna get really big right mm -hmm. now. Every time I kind of like reversed mm -hmm. it, it backfired and I'm just like, just don't listen to the people who are full of it and so just like put the work in and care about the project and the rest will kind of take care of itself don't worry about getting famous or or like having eyes or views on your work um and the people who are promising that or are like oh for i don't yeah. know 15 bucks get your work in front of this director or producer it's nine times out of ten it's a money-making scheme and and you are the mark and that's yes. yeah so yeah yeah, I think it's similar to like the people who come come at you on Instagram and they're like, do you want to have 10,000 followers? Like, right. Yeah, you know, it's kind of it, the followers are fake. It's, it's you're going to get kicked off Instagram. It's it's always that kind of thing. Like you, any quick get quick, get fame quick, get rich quick. It's it's not going to happen. If, if you love a certain like filmmaker that you love their style and you're like, oh, I want to try that out like try it out try to emulate them that's how you learn there's nothing wrong with that but like if you think that like this this is the one thing I took away from changing careers going from photographer to filmmaker is because I remember seeing an ad uh on it's, it was pdn online photo district news online and it said like learn photography in 48 hours with this master photographer and I just remember being like I just spent four years in college and I'm still learning and I know that I'm better than when I started, but there's, I'll keep it clean, but there's no blanking way that you can learn this. If this is, so I remember thinking like, watch out for scams like this or watch out for people who are just like, you know, um, and yeah, I mean, just like you learn by doing it, just do it. Like, and, and if you just do if, it, just do it. And if, and if it's, if it sucks or if it doesn't come out, like it's supposed to, like, at least you learned a way not to do it and totally watch I, i'm i'm 38 years old i am still making stuff and i watch youtube tutorials on either post-production or cameras mm -hmm. or lenses all the time like i'm like oh i i just shot a short last week uh, last month i learned how to make a smoke machine out of a insect fogger <laughs> who cares like and it's like i don't need the 800 dollar like uh in you know smoke machine you know you're just always learning so just put the work in just always learn just do it you know kind of thing so love that yeah okay 
your 18 year old self, what are you yelling at her? Yeah. <laughs> I'm yelling at her for a lot. But <laughs> we don't have time for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but I, you know, I'm going to refer back a little bit to what I said earlier about following your instinct and really, really listening to your God. Um, you know, whatever, whatever it is you do, <clears throat> You know, even when you follow your instinct, you're you're always going to have that little voice in the back that's like, oh, is this right? And is it, don't listen to that, and don't rely on other people's reassurance or support. Mm. Um, you have to believe in yourself, no matter what it is you're doing. You know, because um, as as Mike touched on it, you know, maybe if something doesn't turn out the way you thought, you still learn something from it, and you're still going to carry that with you um, through yeah. whatever else that you do in life, you know, appreciate every single step of the way, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it, all of it, all of it, and take pride in what you do, whether you're running around getting coffee for people or sweeping, or you are at the top of the chain, take complete pride in what you do and be humble and, you know, believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, how is anybody else going to believe in you? Don't listen to any, hmm. anybody, don't rely, not don't listen to anybody. You know, some, a lot of people yeah, yeah. do have good advice no. to give, but just don't rely on, on the reassurance of others. You know, if somebody tells you no a million times, you're going to get that yes one day and, you know, and you're going to make it happen. Keep going. So I'm going to record this and then just like play it on my phone over and over for myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's advice we still need at, at any age. <laughs> Kyle. Yes, this is a big question. It made me think of um, just quick side note on, on on RuPaul's Drag Race. There's always a moment <laughs> where they're like, they hold up a picture of like the, you know, the younger self. And it's like, what would you say to the younger self? And I, <laughs> uh, you know. I, I, I haven't seen it, sadly, but uh, I will now. <laughs> yeah, I always like, what would I say to myself? Oh, I should I mean, have I asked you for your, your younger self picture. That would have been like, make you talk to it. Like, like a whole <laughs> yeah. Back. I had a whole head of platinum blonde hair and I just, I kept help thinking like, what would it be like if I still had that hair? But <laughs> alas, that's, you know, that's part of life. Um, you know, I, I think twofold, there's kind of like a philosophical thing I would say is, you know, and this I think speaks more to my creative side is like, don't, um, you know, it's like, let go of the shoulds and let go of like what I think I should, um, mm. you know, that shoulds being like, oh, I should be interested in this artist or, oh, I should go see this film or, oh, you know, my taste isn't refined enough or whatever. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time mm. sort of denying my own taste, well, you know, my own aesthetic yeah. because I thought it wasn't highbrow enough or I thought it wasn't whatever enough. I mean, you know, I, I draw inspiration from everything, whether it's, you know, Teen Wolf or Run Lola Run. So it's kind of uh, like whatever it is. You that's know, like just... one of my favorite mo movies ever, Run Lola Run. Great. Yeah. But it's, you know, there is. But a, yes, there was... no, I, hear, I don't mean to. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. I also I mean, love there... Teen Wolf. Yeah, great. It's great. I mean, there, you know, but I think there, I always kind of had that inner critic that was telling me like, you know, be different than you, who you are, which I mean, again, can be like a whole other thing. But I think, you know, as as an artist, it's like really trust that because, you know, I feel like my creative impulses are coming from, you know, for me, that's the channel and that's kind of the universe. And it's yes, like, I've yes, just yes. learned to listen to that. Um, so that's sort of the philosophical side. And then I would say the kind of the more practical side is I really wish I'd studied business. I mean, I think particularly as a theater major, you know, it's very much like, here's how to create a movement piece, which is great. But like, if you don't know how to like, you here's know, a spread, how to create a spreadsheet and a budget <laughs> right, exactly. and do your taxes. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that all should be absolutely required. Like they do yeah. us a huge disservice. There's a great meme going around. It's like one of those t early Tom and Jerry clips where like, you know, Tom's like this and, and the meme is something like, well, I don't know how to do my taxes, but you know, school taught me and it's like some algebraic equation and uh, it's yeah. like, thanks a lot school, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. like, couldn't you have taught me something useful? 
<laughs> no, yeah. So, I mean, in hindsight, I would have said like, yes, study theater, but get that minor in business because I mean, Thanks. you know, that's, that's, I think it, it I, is, you have to be an entrepreneur to do this. That's one thing I tell all the kids too. I'm like, if you have any inclination, maybe study accounting. And they're like, Ugh. and I'm like, no, I can't, I can't tell you enough how, how much I wish I'd studied accounting. Right. But I had a, an accountant as an older sister who was like, anything but accounting because she hated it so much and you know but it would have been so helpful <laughs> that's actually one of the points that i meant to bring up earlier and i was like oh, maybe not and so you know something Study like accounting. Uh, as accounting it's like, first of all every single industry needs an accountant every, right? you can there's get a job a single, anywhere right there's accounting. not one industry that does not have either an accounting department or, or a an accounting firm. But, you know, in this industry specifically, it, that could give you a leg up because, you know, at the top of the chain, they're, you're, yes. you're the one that's allocating certain funds, you know, that's doing the budgets, you know. Yeah, somebody's got to come up with the idea for the project and, and do the writing. But, you know, it's only going to happen if you can, if you can manage funds. the budget. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. You know, so like line not a bad producers idea. are huge, right? And, <laughs> and they're I'm in sure high demand. Fun. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of, you're also in the bummer position. You have to be the one they, sorry, we can't afford to do this. Sorry, we can't afford to do that. I get that. That was kind of my sister's thing. She was like, Ugh. but, uh, you know, I've just seen like, as I look for jobs, even like remote work as, as a, you know, as a mom, remote work or like part-time work, like accounting can get you any job anywhere. <laughs> so that's my advice. It's like, if you can stomach it, do accounting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah because you're also gonna have to pay i mean for me it's like you are gonna have to pay the bills you know and it's like where you're gonna yeah. wait tables you're gonna work in an office i mean yes i one day would like to make you know be able to support myself with my art but until then however right you know, and even then job. like even if you were supporting yourself with your art if you don't know how to manage your own money so if somebody else is doing that for you, there's, a, you know, every story in Hollywood, it has that going on, right? Where, where somebody swindled somebody because they didn't know how to manage their money. So yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a wise thing to do no matter what. <laughs> so uh, we'd like to open it up for any questions from our interns, our audience. Anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Feel free to uh, unmute yourself or write it in the chat, whatever you're more comfortable with. Yay, go ahead and what's your question? Um, because I'm very curious, and I, I like to care about this. It's like, wait, whatever your field you're in right now, what job you work on, what exactly was like, if there's one thing in like media, like a movie or a show or even like a script, anything that like was the one like pushing factor that said, oh, I really want to do this now too. Like a movie, mm. let's say you liked the screenplay or just thought okay maybe I would like to direct something like this was there some kind of project that kicked off your interest where you were like yeah. this is what I have to do that's yeah. that's a great question anyone um yeah I'll, I'll kick it off so, um there's two when I was in high school Rushmore I remember hmm. seeing Rushmore in, in high school and just like walking out and being like I've never seen a film like that and that just like totally broadened like a lot of things uh, and the second was um, No Country for Old Men um, is a really heavy movie. And you'd be surprised how many times I've watched that on repeat. And it, it, there's just a lot of different like threads going about it. But that was like the one where I had just started making my own films. And I was just like, and hey, the Coen brothers are masters. So I'm not trying to compare myself to them. But I was just like, oh, that's what's possible. Like that mm -hmm. there's like total, not only just subverting expectations, but like the emotions and themes and there any which way i watch that film it's not i've met people who hate that film so don't if you watch and you don't like it don't don't be upset at me don't hate you yeah don't hate me but like when i watch that with like it's almost like the shining you know how like people like think oh the shining's about this this and this and this i watch no country for old men thinking oh let me watch it from this lens and it works no let me watch it from this lens and it works and it's just mm. like it is such a thick layered amazing it's like an incredible film and the themes throughout it um that's the thing that i was just like oh i, I don't want to try to emulate that but that's what's possible so something rich and layered and full. yeah and just like speaks to everybody at every age and every you know and like 
And then I've also speak, spoken to people and be like, what's happened? What happened to the satchel of money in the minute in the, to that movie? I'm like, that's not what the movie's about, but okay. That's what you're after. You know? So yeah, um, yeah that, that, that movie I would probably say is like um, kind of like my, I think I used the term before too, like my North star a little bit of like, Oh, okay. That's what that, that, that's what it can be about. Cool. Mayor Kyle. Uh, I, I can go. Um, yeah, I was, I, you know, I, I was thinking about it for me. Um, uh, I really admire the work of Todd Haynes who did, um, far from heaven and Carol and, mm -hmm. um, I'm not there, but I, I, in particular, far from heaven, I have this memory of being in high school and it was like opening night. We were at the art art theater in Denver. I grew up in Colorado and there was this, this, this man in front of us and he turns and he's like, how old are you? And I was like, oh, you know, I'm 15 or 16 or whatever. He was like, my son is 15 and he's going to see Jackass. Like, why are you seeing this movie? <laughs> I mean, whatever. See, see, I go back to my other point, like see what inspires you. But I think right. what I, I, <laughs> I love about that, that film Jackass is, is a great movie. <laughs> yeah. It is, yeah. It's great. Um, I actually haven't seen it, but I get, that's not a judgment thing. It's just a, a taste thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but but um you know far from heaven I think what I because I I draw a lot of inspiration from pop culture and I think what I really love about his work is he sort of takes the 1950s melodrama and sort of on one hand pays homage to it but then on the other hand kind of like opens it up a little bit so he starts to explore themes that they weren't allowed to explore in the 50s so you know her husband is closeted there's some interesting racial dynamics happening and I, I just for me, it's very inspiring to see how you can take, you know, this sort of genre, this form and kind of open it up um, and expand upon it and in investigate it. And um, it's also just a beautiful film. I mean, the art, art direction, it's filmed in Connecticut in the fall and it's just really rich and beautiful. And I love and what's Julian the name Moore. of it again? Uh, it's called Far From Heaven. Far From um, Heaven, okay. I think it's late 90s, early 2000s, Julianne Moore. Um, uh, Dennis Quaid. It's just, it's just a beautiful, beautiful movie. Awesome. Yeah. Faye, do you have a, any you'd like to share? I am a sucker for love, right? Like rom <laughs> anything romantic and dramatic and emotional, like, yeah, typical, but <laughs> I'm a huge sucker for this. So like, but I, I do uh, gravitate towards like period films. Those really tend to inspire me. Um, you know, but that have uh, a romantic a layer of romance. So, like, you know, story, my favorite, yeah. one of my absolute favorites is Titanic. Is what? Titanic. Titanic. Yes. I know it's, it sounds very, you know, like, of course she loves it. I do. Yes. I love Titanic. I've watched it a million times and I'll watch it again and again. The notebook, you know, Pearl Harbor, anything that's like kind of a period film, right. but like with, a, with a heavy layer historical of fiction and, with romance. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really what what um, I kind of gravitate towards. But um, you know, I actually, <laughs> I, when I was younger, I did. I wanted to be an I wanted to be an actor, right? And I, at my dance school, you know, I, I danced. Yes. Uh, we spoke about this, Nina. So at my dance school, we would also put on um, plays. It wasn't just ballet and tap and jazz. We also did a lot of, she was very into theater. And Greek uh, Director. And, um, you know, so I did a lot of acting with her. And that was what had inspired me. But, you know, it's, it's not for everybody. And I realized after a certain point in time that I just didn't have it. As much as I'm not shy, um, at some point, Later in life, later in life, my teenage years. <laughs> I had been doing this with her at the dance school since I was six, so I say later. But you know, I realized I have stage fright, and I was like, okay, maybe this is not the way to go. <laughs> well, it's awful because you get to that. I, I see it too in the kids we work with. So we work with that six to twelve age group, and um, you see, like around nine, they're up for anything. Like they'll do, and they have the best ideas. They're totally off the wall, yeah. but they're they're super into it. And then by 11, 12, they start to get really self-conscious and it's all about, mm -hmm. you know, fitting in versus being interesting and unique. So it's just that whole hormonal and human like must assimilate thing. Uh, right. But yeah, you, you see it as, it, like I've seen it happen. 
Right, right. I'm yeah. actually shooting a film with uh, six to twelve year olds tomorrow and Sunday, and uh, they're still in that phase where they they're super. That's gonna be a lot of fun. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's gonna be. I hope it doesn't rain too much because it's mostly outside because of COVID. Still, I'm trying to keep them out, but um, but yeah, they're they're like so into it and so creative and like so the, the ideas are super crazy but really fun you're like all right yeah let's let's have a steampunk like we're interdimensional <laughs> travel and each dimension is a different like genre so there's like a 80s hip-hop dimension there's a <laughs> steampunk dimension there's like a everybody's an american girl doll dimension that was the six-year-old so um yeah it should be interesting <laughs> But I love that. I love that age. But you do see like once they hit that 12, mm, I want, you know, that's like everybody yeah. retreats back into their shell because they don't want right. to be the one that stands out. And it's right. It's, it's, right. It's, it's that fear. It's the fear of, you know, failing, the fear of embarrassing yourself, right. you know, and um, I mean, to this day, there's nights that I stay up and I go, oh my God, I said that 20 years ago. Like, <laughs> oh gosh. Oh yeah, I do that. Oh gosh. Yeah. You know, yes. But, yes. you know, everybody experiences that and um, that's okay. You know, Absolutely. you find your way one way or another. I, I think the, the, the people who power through that and don't retreat are the ones who like really have an interesting teen years. Otherwise, you're just like hiding in your bedroom, <laughs> you know, <laughs> waiting for it to be over. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and I also think that art can carry you through that. Like, right, I had dance and that was how I kept my creative side going. And, you know, through those years where I didn't really want to be seen, um, but I knew I did dance really well, right? So that was my push forward. Um, and I think, you know, that's the same kind of thing, giving kids film film lessons. And then now they all, they all have their auteur that they want to embody. <laughs> You know, they're nine they're like oh I want to be the next Wes Anderson I'm like okay good like yeah let's let's do a let's do this in Wes Anderson format like let's you know that kind of thing so yeah it's it's great it's great other questions anyone hi I have a question um hi, I, How are you? hello um I recently graduated from the school of visual arts I studied graphic design and I'm really interested in props, like prop design, set decorating. Um, I don't know if that's too niche, but I was wondering if you guys had any advice for getting started in that lane. Do you know, Faye, of like what companies there are that you might look into? Like I, I don't, I'm not familiar with the prop companies per se, um, but you might be more yeah, you know, there. unfortunately, I, I'm sorry, I don't really have an answer for you on that. I'm not too familiar with them either. Um, I know a lot of studios, um, at least in LA, tend to have their own prop houses. So, yeah. you know, uh, but here, like we, for example, and I get calls about that too, we don't have a prop house here uh, in house. Mm -hmm. Every production brings their own um, department in for that. So, you know, I would say, you know, just knock on doors, make calls, find out who's filming where. Um, and, and try to get in. But if you're, you know, planning on, on moving to LA, then knock on the studio's doors too. <laughs> yeah, so, so in LA, the studios tend to have prop houses in-house, but right, here you're yeah. saying it's some, the production yeah. companies that you need to look into. Right. So what yeah. are some of the production company names if you're able to share like generally? Um, well, I mean like any production company, God, there's so many, I don't know. Um, no. <laughs> no, really, there's just so many. Like right now we've got, um, we have Succession coming in and they're with the uh, Sourdough Productions, right? So, but there's just, God, there's a million. There really are a million. So, so I Google production companies and start yeah. to call them. See what's or... filming, see what's filming around in the area and, uh, you know, shoot out emails, send your resume, knock on doors, pick up the phone. Be, be uh, annoying, but not too yeah. annoying. Like be persistent. Right. Yes. Be persistent, but not annoying. How's that? Yes. Yes. A persistent hustle. There's yeah. a there's a prop house that I've used in Queens in Long Island City called Eclectic Encore, but they're there that's where you go to rent the stuff. It's not exactly like they will come to like dress it, um, but they might be a good point person to be like, hey, who's your biggest customer? Who comes yes. in here a lot? Um, also, I mean, I I don't try to like I you try to not to use the word stalk, <laughs> uh, but like <laughs> for LinkedIn, legal purposes for yes. legal purposes as I'm as this is being recorded, but like LinkedIn 
is a really great resource to like, mm, I guess, yes. Faye, what would you say is the, the title? Would you say like production designer, set dresser, stylist, like something like that? I would probably look for like set deck or set dressing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I If you look through that on LinkedIn and then just start looking at names or even you can Google it and these people will have websites too. And then just start reaching out really like Faye said, just like knock on doors and like somebody will like say like, Hey, why don't you come on set this day? Or, or I'm looking for an intern or something like that. Right. And you can also, right. just, you may not, Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was gonna say, right. You may not get in right away. You know what I mean? But, but you're bound to learn more information. The more people you talk to, you know, they can mm-hmm. lead you to, uh, to more information or better information or better contacts. I mean, I, I when I first got out of college, I wanted to work in children's television, right? So I was kind of just, um, I went to, you know, the college alumni office and I asked for a printout of like the alumni who registered as mentors who were, um, you know, in children's television in New York City. And then I just kept calling their offices until somebody said, okay, come in. And I just, you know, I just want to talk. I just want to understand what the job's about. Like get recommendations about how I might get into the industry. I wasn't asking for a job. I was just asking for information, right? So that I didn't want to pressure them. But they know you want a job, so you don't have to really, you know. And so, um, and I remember going and you know meeting people at Nickelodeon, meeting people at Sesame Street, um, and they then would pass me on to somebody else. Like I don't have anything for you now, but why don't you go talk to so and so in this department? And it took me like six months of like going around and talking to people and holding you know meetings and getting passed around to the next person until I finally get got an internship at Sesame Street, right? But I did eventually get the internship at Sesame Street. It took six months of, of that legwork. Um, so, and this was pre-internet. So like, I couldn't even just look them up. It was like, so I really had a call and like schmooze the assistants because that's how I got anything from anyone. So um, so you, you will have it a little easier if you look on LinkedIn and, and Google, but, you know, and, and I would just send, send, you know, call and remind, oh, you just wanted to check back in, like, is she free anytime in the coming month? You know, can, can I get on her calendar? Can I just pop in and say hi? You know, I literally had a meeting with some Nickelodeon executive in the hallway, because <laughs> that's all the time she would afford me, right? So, um, yeah, but she, she, you know, passed me on to someone. I, I learned things as I interviewed. So I knew what, what, they, what the company was working on for at the time. Noggin hadn't come out yet. I knew it was being, in, it was in development. And then, um, so I did my internship at Sesame Street. Eventually, then I, after that, I went to Merrill Lynch, which is a whole other thing. And then a year later, uh, an opportunity came up to go to back, go to back to Nickelodeon, go to Nickelodeon, I hadn't been there yet. Um, and when I got there for the inter- the interview, I said, I you know I've I'd heard about this this channel that's coming out, this educational, and I want to work on that. And then I got us, you know, I was able to work on Noggin. So kind of uh, the the information that I gathered in my you know six months of just walking the path to find out if, if there were jobs, I still gained information that helped me get my future positions, even though I didn't get them at that time, you know. Right. Does that help? Yes. Yes. That was helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck. I think it's awesome. I mean, you know, there's tons of, even if you're like, there's so many, uh, there's a bunch of prop masters on TikTok that I follow that I actually download their videos and use them as part of my classes to teach because I want the kids to understand like what goes on, like reach out to them and say, Hey, I love this. I'm right out of, co- you know, this is what I want to do. Like, how do you get into this? Do you have any suggestions? They may not respond. They may respond, you know, like um, just keep reaching out and don't be afraid to reach out. Somebody will respond. And if you're like, wow, you're amazing. And I love what you do. And that's what I want to do. And I'm a kid help me, <laughs> you know, like more than not, they'll respond. They want to help. People usually want to help. Yeah. Um, and also the people that respond are going to be the per- people you want to work for anyway. And the people who don't respond yeah. are the jerks. So it's don't a self-selective process. So yeah. if they don't respond, you're better off not talking. I, I can't tell you how many times just like an offer to be like, Hey, can I just buy you a cup of coffee and just like pick your brain for 20 minutes has like worked. And then it's actually worked on me as well. So like, just don't, don't have, have no fear and just, you can just do it that way. Yeah. Just, just do it. Like, don't, don't base your worth on their responses. You know what I mean? Just, just be like, okay, this is like, as if you're doing a class, like make, think of it as like an assignment. Oh, I have to call so-and-so because I have to, you know, have, 
X number of meetings this month, right? <laughs> like make it like a class assignment in your head. I'm saying just to like get over that anxiety of like, oh, I don't want to call this person. I love that advice, Nina. I think that's excellent. That's that's a really great way to approach it. And I tap tap your professors for information too. You know, keep in touch yes. with them. Yeah, SVA has has connections. That's why you paid lots of money to go there. Make them work for you. Go back to the alumni office. I'm serious. Go back to the alumni office at SVA. Do you have alumni that you know I can contact? I want to do this. I'm sure they do. I'm sure they they, they contact those alumni to get donations. They can sure as heck give you All that list time. to get get a job. <laughs> I'm living proof. SVA yes, has an alumni every and, couple and of minutes. They are very I get a actually. Donation I think request, they're, so. they're getting more with COVID kind of like winding down a little bit, they're, they're definitely putting on more alumni stuff. I forget the new head of alumni, but she was really nice. Anyway, yes, Nina's 100% correct. You, you Use your connections from the mass amount of tuition you just paid mm -hmm. to get some more connections. So. Work that school. Like, yeah. I'm serious. Like, just harass them till they mm -hmm. give you an answer. <laughs> they, they owe you that. 100% they owe you that. I definitely agree. I'm definitely going to do that. Cool. Good luck, sweetheart. Thank you. Anyone else? Guys, thank you so much. I've kept you over a bit, so I apologize for the time, but uh, I'm, I love you. I, I appreciate your time. I appreciate all you do. I appreciate you hanging out with us and talking to us, and I will be putting this all around social and um, passing it along to you as well. So thank you for everything that you, you've you done for, for me, for the festival, for us, and for everyone who, who will be watching. So thank you. Thank you, Nina. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. This was Have a great weekend. weekend. Yeah. You too. Enjoy. Stay safe. That new that new variant, four people are, are currently sick that I know in the past just a week. So mask up, Eddie's Mask up. <laughs> I know we hate them, but please stay safe. All right, guys, take Bye, care. Everybody. Thank you. This is great. Bye. Bye.